So as many of you know, I grew up in Arkansas with my grandparents. Uh, and my grandparents were deeply religious folk. And that meant that every Sunday we were in church, beginning at 9.30 in the morning with Sunday school and then 11 o'clock in the morning for the regular service, which went until about 1, and then back at 5 p.m. for BTU, uh, that's Baptist uh, Training Union, because what would the world be if Baptists were not well-trained? And so we would do that every Sunday, but then every spring there was uh, revival, and which was essentially church in quintuplicate. So for one week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, in the evening, we would have an evening service. So the choir would sing, and our preacher, uh, the Reverend John H. Nolan, uh, caramel skin, a wiry frame, wire-rimmed glasses, and a big, booming voice would preach to us from the pulpit. And then at the end of the sermon, he would say, he would announce, that the doors of the church were open. And so he was metaphorically opening the doors of the church to new members. And he would beckon to the deacons who would set two folding chairs down at the front of the room facing the pulpit and facing him. And the choir would stand and lead us all in singing, what a friend we have in Jesus. And then we would wait. And we would wait for someone who hadn't yet been baptized to sit in one of those chairs and thus declare that they were ready to accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior and be baptized. Most of the time, the congregation was disappointed because no one would step forward and we would just move on and hope that the next night someone might step forward. In 1983, during the revival season, I was 11 years old, almost 12 years old, almost the age when I knew that my grandmother and grandfather thought, most kids who were going to actually be baptized would actually sit in one of those chairs. I still hadn't sat in one of those chairs. I was sitting in the front pew, the so-called mourner's bench, where the penitent sinners seeking salvation would sit. But eventually, you were expected to move to one of those chairs when the Spirit moved you. And I wanted the Spirit to move me. I wanted to feel something. And I also imagined, I'm not sure I was right, but I imagined that my family was going to be disappointed if I reached 12 and didn't move to that chair. I think that was all in my head, but that's what I felt. And so I sat there, and even though the spirit never moved me, I never felt anything, because I was the kind of boy who did what I thought was expected of me, one evening I got up and I moved to one of those chairs. And there was rejoicing. Uh, Mother Watson, uh, my Sunday school teacher, went into one of her weeping frenzies to celebrate the fact that someone else was about to have his sins washed away by the blood of Christ, and there was much joy. And this spectacle uh, played out by a cast of all black church members fell under the watchful blue eyes of a stained glass Jesus Christ, uh, whose sandy blonde hair and fair skin were a testament to religious fervor and racial confusion as he looked down from above the baptismal pool. And it was in that baptismal pool that I was standing a few days later wearing my white baptismal gown, standing next to Reverend Nolan in his black uh, uh, minister's uh, gown in the water, and I was wearing swimming trunks underneath the white gown because a few weeks prior, a woman had been baptized. And as we all discovered, when you're not wearing anything under a thin white gown that gets very, very wet and you're backlit by sun streaming through the face of Jesus Christ above the baptismal pool, that's not a combination that's suitable for the Damascus Missionary Baptist Church. So I had been warned to wear swimming trunks. Down I went into the water, and I emerged expecting finally to feel something, to feel that spirit wash over me. But all I felt was the companion I had had all along, which was doubt, <laughs> doubt about whether there was even a God. And I thought someday the faith will come, but it never did. And in fact, years later, as I walked with my very devout aunt, after having told her, you know, I'm an atheist. I have nothing but doubt, no belief in God. And she said, well, I'm sure God's going to bring you back. And I s asked, is there anything that I can say to convince you that that's not going to happen? And she said, nope. And I said, oh, well, okay. 
And so my family and I have continued to go forward through the years, and they have their faith, and I have my doubt. And when I'm having hard times, I know that I'm in their prayers. And when they're having hard times, I tell them that they're in my thoughts. And so they go forward with their faith, and I go forward with my doubt. But we love each other, and we stumble on. And thanks, and welcome to the corner.